Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Mirror Talks with Bentinho Massaro. This episode, How Personal Identity, Ego, is Structured, is a technical overview of what the ego is. The topic of the ego is so familiar and so frequently discussed, especially in a spiritual or personal development context, but rarely do we break it down into its components. What are the layers that make up personal identity and how does one move through those layers? This is a great foundational episode that will contextualize future episodes and many of Bentinho's more advanced teachings. By the way, Bentinho draws a diagram in this episode and refers back to it continually. So you may want to watch on YouTube or bentinomasaro.tv instead of listening. Enjoy. So we were talking about, because this first season, we want to get some of the main fundamental topics out there and deconstruct them or explain them so that people have this sort of first season of this podcast of Mirror Talks. And and we're not sure if there's going to be a second season, but if there is, then this will be foundational. Like the topics during this podcast, season one will be foundational. People can refer back to it. I actually recommend people rewatch it multiple times to really get it because Mm -hmm. even as we're talking about it, it's already, and we're thinking back of something that we recorded three weeks ago. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, that was, that was quite nice and good and like had a transformative effect. But what was it about again? So mm-hmm. I really do recommend people go back and revisit these foundational sessions. So we want to lay out a f- series of foundational topics. Um, so we've talked about relationships, we've talked about the emotional, emotional, guidance. Gu- emotional guidance system, um, kind of what is spirituality, and a few more topics. And one question that often arises, especially sort of from a mainstream perspective, I think, as people get interested in spirituality. The obvious question is like, what is spirituality? What will it mean for my life? But also like, what is like, what's the ego? What is my mind? What is my psychology? How does it work? Do we want to talk a little bit about um, like what the mind, are we going to go into that in in a bit anyway? Like what the mind is, what the ego is? Or... Mm -hmm. Because even the word ego to me sounds like if I'm listening to this and I haven't really heard that before, you've already lost me at ego. So it, I kind of like, what is it like personality or uh, the lens with which you see the world? Like what? how does the ego, uh, yeah, like how do I connect that as a normal person? Mm-hmm. I'm just kind of like thinking out loud here. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think there's so many different books and teachings and teachers that talk about ego we hear that word so often so to really ground it in the practical spirituality that we're talking about here would be a great idea good start google defines ego as or actually uh, oxford languages a person's sense of self-esteem or self-importance the part of the mind that mediates between the conscious and the unconscious and is responsible for reality testing and a sense of personal identity. Hmm. In philosophy or metaphysics, a conscious thinking subject. Cool. Do you like that definition? Yeah, I do. We can roll with that. Nice. Um, But I'll kind of define it in my own terms. And I want to define it from the vantage point of the, sort of a spiritual overview or a spiritual vantage point, because 
it's one thing to kind of know what the ego is, but if you don't then really know what to do with that, or like, what's the goal? Is there a goal? What, what should I do with the ego? Is it good? Is it bad? What exactly is it? And how should I approach it, especially if I consider myself to be a spiritual aspirant, and I'm meditating, and I want greater happiness in life, I want to express myself with greater purity, I want to be more of service to others, I want to be more genuine in my communications, and so on and so forth. So ego, I would define it as simply one's sense of me, one's sense of self. So it is not a static phenomenon. It is not the same all the time. It's not like, oh, this is the ego. Um, you could say it in that way, and just kind of put everything under that banner of the ego, everything that's mind based, everything that has thoughts, everything that is related to the character and the personality and one's experiences on an individual level. You could all call that the ego, but it lacks a little bit in accuracy, and therefore impracticality. Because then again, you go listen to different teachings, and it's like, well, what do they mean with ego? So I'm kind of looking at the diagram that I drew in the back of the room. But before I go to that diagram, I'll just give a basic understanding of uh, my understanding of ego. Most people that are listening to this, they already know by this point that my view is that in a, in a deeper sense, we are consciousness itself, we are that power to know, like we said in yesterday's uh, recording about spirituality really being science. And that it's the science of the self knowing itself, the consciousness knowing itself. And that there is this power to know that no one can deny there's this, this almost mystical quality of I exist, that we don't really know how it got here. And and there's a power in us, in each of us, to know, without which we couldn't have any kind of dialogue, we couldn't have any kind of scientific finding, we couldn't have a thought, we couldn't have an emotion, we couldn't report on experiences, we couldn't report on memories. So there's a power in us, a seemingly mysterious power to know. It's mysterious because it's uninvestigated. But this power to know, if we were to visualize it, because I understand that the mind kind of needs images to understand things. But ultimately, consciousness or awareness or the power to know doesn't have a form. It doesn't have a form of its own. It's ever present. It's ever knowing whatever form appears within our experiences. And so that consciousness, if it's not maintained, if it's not self maintained, self controlled, if you will, if it's not self aware, it will automatically take on the shape of whatever it perceives. Mm. As opposed to when we're resting in, in consciousness, that's conscious of itself, or the power to know, being aware of its power to know, without any contents, without any projections of thoughts and emotions and labels, then we are maintaining self awareness, we're maintaining an awareness of this power to know of this formless quality. And then we'll begin to experience what we say, or what we point to when we use words such as formlessness. But most people don't maintain awareness of itself, of consciousness of themselves as consciousness, they are aware of some kind of an object of perception, whether it's the senses, a label, a memory, uh, the sensation of the body, um, an interaction with someone else and what they may be thinking about us thoughts about what they're thinking about us. And so whatever the object of perception is in any given moment, this innate power to know which is formless, in essence, in a sense, you could say, collapses or seems to collapse around the object of perception, thus then producing an effect, a sensation that wasn't there before. It's like the rainbow appears when you put sunlight and raindrops together. The rainbow doesn't really have a substance of its own. It's not always there. It appears when you put water and sunlight together. Very similarly, the ego or the sense of me becomes whatever the consciousness or the sunlight, if you will, 
collapses itself around by lack of maintaining itself in its original awareness. And so then automatically from this sort of semi quasi, or you could even say unconscious state, in a sense, like a lesser conscious state, automatically, this consciousness wraps itself around the object of perception, whatever the object might be. And again, I'm calling thoughts objects as well. I, typically, I call everything appearances, because in the later stages of self realization, you begin to really understand and glimpse and experience how there is no material existence. Therefore, everything appears to be just like a dream appears to be the objects in your dream appear to be objects. But you know, when you wake up that they were really just hallucinations, in a, in a sense, they were imaginations, they were projections of consciousness. But the consciousness in the dream, and in this case, the waking dream, when it's on automatic pilot, when it's not investigated, when it's not self maintained, when an awareness of the power to know, the power of I am, the power of I know, when that awareness is not maintained, and for most people, it's hardly ever there, then one is at the whim of, one is victim of, one could almost say, one's own sort of unconscious choice to not maintain that awareness, that self identity in its most original formless condition. And then what happens is that this formlessness takes on the shape of the appearance that appears in front of itself or within itself like the light of the projector beam takes on the shape of Tom Cruise, or whatever it is, a land, beautiful landscape or a dog. But the light is not the dog. The light is not Tom Cruise. It appears that Tom Cruise is on the screen. It appears that the dog is on the screen. It appears that there's a landscape on the screen. But it is all made of light. But the light itself, you could say in this analogy is the formless essence. And the image that's projected is the appearance, it's the hallucination, it's the imagery, it's the objects of perception that do not exist apart from the light, you cannot have Tom Cruise appear on the screen, apart from the screen or apart from the light. Similarly, we don't know anything apart from the power to know it. The power to know it is most essential, most fundamental to anything we know. There is an intrinsic inseparability between the perceiver and its perception between consciousness and the objects of perception. But again, this, this describes kind of a state of enlightenment, knowing this maintaining this awareness, whereas the state of unenlightenment where most people find themselves in automatically takes on the shape of whatever appears as the object. So basically, ego does not exist what we refer to as the ego, the sense of self does not exist as a real thing. It is a tertiary effect, it is a third effect of putting two things together, awareness, and object or appearance. When that awareness takes on the shape, takes on the identity associates with the form of the appearance, the shape, the label and so forth, it produces automatically a sense of I am this, or I am that. So therefore, and this is unconscious for most people, we don't go think, Oh, look, now I'm going mm -hmm. from formless, perfect awareness, into this sense of I am this body, or I am this person that's being attacked, or I am, um, I am so close to my dog, or we're not aware of it, it just feels to be who we are, it's on automatic pilot. So the ego is automatic ignorance. The ego is the feeling I am this or that, as opposed to the feeling or direct perception of I am. So the ego only comes into play when we forget the I am. Because the sense of self in the tertiary effect sense of the word, like where we become an object, of perception, where we become associated with an object within awareness, that only appears when we forget to maintain an awareness that we are the power to know itself in its formless state, in its original, ever present, timeless, always here now, already here, formless, obviousness, the obviousness of I know, 
and I am. But through conditioning, which simply means by watching this movie of life for so long without maintaining awareness of awareness, we automatically have become associated with so many objects, and with some objects more than other objects, such as the body. And then the sense that is that, that radiates off of that association is the ego. That's where the sense of self is positioned. That's why even though we all are this great I am, this God is this beingness, this universal oneness, existence, entity, this beingness, even though we in essence always already are that. Different people identify themselves at different levels with different objects and therefore and to different degrees of ignorance or density. And therefore, everyone's ego is sort of different. It's all over the place. Mm. If we define ego as one subjective, automatic sense of me. Not to say that when we're in the I am, there is no sense of self. But in that sense, in that case, it is in its naked condition. It, it's, it, you could say it's the ego, the God ego. It's the ego in the condition of enlightenment. But that's not typically what we mean when we when we say ego, but that also could be considered a form of ego, if we define ego as the sense of self, because the sense of self can, in a sense, move up that ladder by retracing its steps away from the projections and back to the original space of consciousness of pure being. The ego, if you will, changes its its shape, its quality from I am this to I am that I am, like we talked about mm -hmm. in the Science and Spirituality uh, podcast episode. Mm -hmm. We're so used to like looking for things and we're so used to objects that once we discover or understand that there's an ego, we think that it's an object in itself. But even that's a huge shift in understanding to see that it's like the ego effect, not the actual ego, the thing. And you guys know the well, I don't know if you know this, but what we say in Ireland is like that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Do you guys say that about rainbows too? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of the ego effect is so comparable to a rainbow because we think that there's a pot of gold at the end of like the ego effect. Mm. Um, but it has a root. Mm -hmm. nice. And we think there's gold there, like something to gain from it. Mm -hmm. But I've looked for the pot of gold so many times <laughs> and like it's not there. Awesome. I love that analogy. Yeah, exactly. So the ego really is, and I call it that quite a bit, like you said, the ego effect is more accurate, because mm -hmm. there is no one ego, ego is an effect. And it's different for different entities, because they identify and associate with different forms to different degrees and to different levels of ignorance or automatic pilotness versus clarity and self awareness. So that's kind of the definition of the ego. So, but to be more sort of specific and kind of break down the psyche, human psyche, the main levels of consciousness that are relevant to our everyday experience as a human, seemingly human being, as, as we would call that, basically a breakdown, a little map of the mind. And so, um, well, if you're if you're listening to this, as just audio, then we recommend that you uh, find the YouTube equivalent of this episode. So you can actually also see the diagram that I drew. And on VintiniaMassaro.tv. Mm -hmm. It's so helpful to just see it mapped out, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I send it to uh, I send it to you guys so you can open it on your mm -hmm. phone as well while we talk about it. Oh, there's like an ascending level of order here, right? There's an ascending level of order. Yeah, cool. Yep. So the foundation is consciousness itself. Because without consciousness, there cannot be a sense of self. Agreed? Right. Yeah. So prior to any identification, any form of ego, there has to be the power to know, the power of consciousness, the power of existing, which is this mysterious, this mystical, in seemingly intangible quality of I am. Now, once this consciousness takes on a perspective, which is the next level down, so there's four levels that I 
that I used for this, uh, the purpose of making this clear. This consciousness, as I said, is formless in its original state. But then it takes on a point of view or a perspective, or you could say an angle. Now it becomes partial. So if you look at the way I drew it, it's literally the consciousness, the circle, with two lines coming out of it, representing the view, the point of view. So now consciousness, instead of being in its original state, free and formless, it takes on a perspective, a bias, a point of view. Then once that perspective is maintained or associated with, because you can have perspectives that just kind of fly by and they don't stick. But when a perspective sticks, or rather you stick to the perspective, it makes sense to you. And you, you start to reinforce it, it crystallizes in the form of a belief. That's the third level of this diagram. Um, do you have it on your phone cards? Okay, nice. So a belief and a perspective are really no different, except the belief is like the ice version mm -hmm. of the perspective being vapor or water, right? It's the perspective is more malleable, initially, at least, but then it crystallizes down into sort of a structure kind of like a box. This box, this belief, then forms the paradigm, the worldview, if you will, mm -hmm. where it becomes part and parcel of the context mm -hmm. of a person's sense of self, and the way that they interpret things. And we often don't really realize those paradigms. We don't realize that we have these points of view that have turned into belief systems. They are in the sub and unconscious, if you will, we call it sub and unconscious, but it's really higher conscious, even higher conscious and super conscious. But because we're not highly conscious, it appears unconscious to us. I like that. I'll explain that a little bit more in a, in a minute. So perspective and belief are really no different except Belief is a crystallized, locked down, solidified perspective that now functions, has a function, serves a, a function, where the perspective just kind of comes and goes and doesn't really create a reality, doesn't really create an experiential reality within consciousness, doesn't really create, it's not yet foundational enough, it's not yet concrete enough to form the stage of the dream experience. Um, the belief is, once the perspective has become a belief, which simply is another way of saying, once you believe in your point of view, it becomes mm -hmm. a paradigm. Now this paradigm is like the stage of a theater that you're watching a show on. Mm -hmm. The stage remains, I mean, they swap it out sometimes during the show, you know, they remove the decor or the background and they change it out. But it's there for a while. And it's the stage onto which it's the context, the paradigm, inside of which we experience our conscious thoughts and emotions and sense perceptions and world. But often, we don't examine the stage. And so we kind of keep ourselves limited to a particular paradigm. Now, one more level down, you have thoughts, emotions and sense perceptions, which kind of form the visible personality, the conscious mind, as we call it. Now, emotions, they're not quite accurate to place here, but I place them here just for convenience sake. And I'll explain a little bit more how emotions actually apply to all these levels mm. in the form of a guidance system. But the emotions as pe people typically relate to emotions, thoughts, basically, thought forms that have sort of a feeling to them, uh, they could be placed in this sort of last conscious segment of this map. So now that this pure consciousness has taken on a point of view or perspective, and it's believed in, and now it's crystallized into a paradigm, the stage has been set. Now onto that stage, there will be thoughts about trees, as you see in the diagram, <laughs> thoughts about mm -hmm. bodies, and thoughts about houses and property and um, belongings and so forth, basically the world. The world is only perceived by thoughts, inside of paradigms due to perspectives inside of consciousness. We don't realize this, because we believe that our perceptions, 
unlike we realize in the dream state at night, have an actual independent reality to them apart from the knower. But again, like we discussed in spirituality actually is advanced science. You can come to the direct experience, the direct knowledge, of how actually everything is a projection of consciousness, and it doesn't actually have an independent existence. And again, certain branches of science over the last 40 years or so have begun to explore this. Mm -hmm. So when you say reality is an illusion, would it be, because I think a lot of people take that as meaning it's directly not real. So it's um, an illusion because it doesn't have its own independent existence apart from you. Exactly. Yeah, nice nuance there. So just because it's not real doesn't mean it doesn't have any relative relevance, mm -hmm. necessarily, especially someone who still heavily sort of unconsciously believes in this whole process, on automatic pilot, it's highly relevant, you can't, it's impossible to take that away, that sense of a reality to their experience. But it is illusory, in essence, in that the objects that we think we perceive, don't actually exist, apart from being perceived, meaning there's not an actual apple that's responsible for my perception of it. But the perception of it could be considered real in the intermittent state or the intermediary state. Ultimately, you'll find, as you go deeper into self realization, that even experiences are not real they too are projections. But I do typically make this distinction that yes, things, objects, the world is not real, but it is real as an experience or perception, right? It's irrelevant, it's, it's real, the experience is real. But the objects are assumed, and the objects are inferred, the objects are beliefs. They're not actually, they don't actually have an existence. Anyway, that's my experience. And people can come to that experience directly in a very clear way, in a very sort of a lucid way, by doing these practices, by deepening back into their consciousness of the I am. So would an example of a perspective be like seeing through the eyes, like incarnating, basically seeing through the eyes of a human body, and then a belief being like, I am this body. Say that again. Would an, so I'm just putting this into like a example, like a, an example of a perspective, like getting a point of view, going from consciousness to having a point of view. Mm -hmm. Would it be like seeing through the eyes of a human incarnation? Because I think a belief would be like, I am this body. No? Like that's like a fixed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what would be the perspective or the point of view that comes before that, that then crystallizes? It would be the consideration or the looking at the body, if you will, the consideration of the body, it's awareness of the body. It's that first sort of outward expression of the mind, where it starts to become the mind as we know it, where consciousness begins to look for lack of a better word, outward, there's not really any outward in my worldview. But for lack of a better word, consciousness starts to look outward, that's the origin of a point of view of a perspective, consciousness takes on a partial perspective. This perspective then begins to appear valid or real and becomes believed in and it becomes a paradigm. The incarnation thing uh, doesn't really easily fit into the system so much. Um, or it would be a it would be a large topic, it would be a complex metaphysical topic. Mm -hmm. But essentially, we, as a soul, as a consciousness, as an individuated expression of that consciousness, we are filled with perspectives. And these perspectives exist during incarnational experience, and they also exist beyond incarnational experience, they don't disappear when the body dies, as we say. Mm -hmm. So the perspectives really, you could almost say, are contained in the soul, the soul is really the collection of points of view, that it's then trying to work out and see 
in the mirror of a apparent physical or quasi-physical reality, an incarnational experience, for example, uh, a bodily experience. So it's like the painter which takes on a vision or a point of view or a feeling, then begins to crystallize that. And onto that canvas, onto that paradigm, it starts to fill it in with the artwork, so that it can see in a tangible way, the outer manifestations that are hints to the perspectives that it's holding at a soul level. So what is a soul attempting to do through the process of incarnation? It is trying to iron out, understand, balance out, clear out, empty out, free, purify its essential nature from its perspectives that it has developed over the course of one could hypothesize millions and millions mm. of years of evolution as a soul consciousness, as an individuated spark of this original God state, the great I am. So having these points of view, many of which have become beliefs or paradigms, then we inevitably need a reflection of them, if we're not directly aware of them, if we're not able to be aware of the subtler levels, so the higher you're looking in this diagram, the subtler, that's why we call it sub and unconscious, because they're too subtle for us to be aware of, or so we think. The subtler we become in our ability to recognize ourselves, consciousness itself being the subtlest, the most formless, therefore the hardest to recognize for an entity who has identified itself with the stage of the theater and a play that's happening at that, on that theater. It's very difficult to remember when you're watching a show where so much is happening on stage, first of all, you don't really recognize the stage except maybe 5% of the time, you're recognizing 95% of the time, the people and the interactions and the Shakespearean talks and dialogues and emotions and drama, maybe 5% of the time, you're like, Oh, look at that background, it's mm -hmm. changed, or oh, well, that's great. How did they do that? So it's only 5% of the time that you kind of zoom out from the conscious level and become somewhat aware of the subconscious level. Now, how often do people, while they're watching a show, while they go to Cirque du Soleil, how often during that show, are you aware of the idea that got you to even buy the tickets to attend the show? It's not part of your awareness, because it's subtle. But it is fundamental. Without it, there would be no theater for you. There would be no drama on the theater. But because it's less visible, because it's more subtle, it recedes into the unconscious as we label it, it's still just our consciousness, but it becomes unconscious to where we position ourselves, it becomes unconscious to our sense of self. Let alone if you're sitting in a theater, how often are you aware that you even exist, which allowed for the intention or point of view to go buy the tickets to then be in the theater, where there is a stage on upon which there then is this dramatic play that you came for, right? You came here for the show. So when you incarnate, you rarely remember that you are, because mm -hmm. you came here for the reflections in a sense. And so that forgetfulness leads to all kinds of delusions and further points of view and beliefs being formed and further need for expressing that in different canvases, different artworks, in other words, different lifetimes or different expressions at different dimensions and so forth. Which give rise to more and more, which gives rise to more and more until we grow in awareness of ourselves, until we become able to recognize ourselves more and more directly at subtler and subtler levels, which is the process, the science of self mastery, the science of self awareness. But without that, we the only way we can experience ourselves is external mm -hmm. is manifest. The more we grow up in awareness, the more we grow in awareness of ourselves, the subtler we become in our ability to recognize that we exist, and that we have these points of view and these sort of unconscious beliefs, the less we actually need to play all of them out on a theater stage, because we can understand them and balance them out and evolve as a soul directly more and more directly. So then there's less need for externalized manifested symbolization of our points of view we can go more directly to our points of view. We need less and less external manifested mm -hmm. reflections in order to hint or point us in the right direction, because everything that's manifest is hinting us 
at a point of view that we're carrying, a distortion. Mm -hmm. Everything is a distortion of the one. Everything is an expression of the one. Everything is a little twist, a little bias, a little point of view of the view, the view within which the points of view can even exist. And the whole evolution of this universe, in my eyes, is spiritual in nature. It is about the evolution of the creator in the form of consciousness, getting to know itself, getting to resolve its biases, getting to know itself directly. Therefore, enlightenment describes the becoming more and more aware of yourself more and more directly at southern levels, with less and less need of investing so much consciousness and ego in the manifest symbolized experiences. So you get to know yourself without this sort of crutch of manifest reality. That's why manifest reality becomes lighter and lighter, more and more malleable, less and less real to one who becomes subtler and subtler in its ego, mm. in its awareness of itself. Mm. Does that make sense? Totally. Makes sense. It's like when you look at this diagram, it's they're kind of like the levels of the game of life, so to speak. Um, and as you go up, you go um, denser, and like dense being um, like the definition of dense is like the concentrated or like compactedness of something mm -hmm. and its own substance. So the higher up you go, the more dense it is with consciousness, like what's real. Mm -hmm. And the lower down you go, like the more dense it is with like what's not real. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And so like you have to, like the game gets more real on the higher levels, but less real on the lower levels, but it, you have to learn through the less real. Um, it's more obvious. I think. It's so cool. Beautiful. Yeah, love that. So the illusion becomes more real, mm -hmm. the less we maintain self awareness, and the illusion becomes less real and ourselves as the I am becomes more of our home, our abode, our realness, and our perspective. And therefore, the illusion appears more transparent and less dense, and the reality of consciousness becomes more real and dense. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so then I simplified the diagram to kind of have it in one complete image. So if you pull up the second diagram, you see all the elements of the first diagram are still contained here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the you squiggly lines, by the way? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I was going to explain that more. Thank you. So but you see here, the circle of consciousness is incorporated, the blue lines of the point of view, the perspective, and then the red lines complete that and turn the perspective into a box, mm -hmm. into a paradigm, inside of which there is now the play that's going on with the thoughts and the emotions mm -hmm. and the personality and the conscious mind. Now, the reason that in both of these diagrams, the squiggly lines, the green squiggly lines, which represent thoughts, basically, and materialized perceptions, they kind of go from a higher wave to a more of a flat line that points in the direction of an object. Mm -hmm. So what you begin to realize as you increase the density of consciousness, the density of self mastery, the density of self awareness, is that objects don't appear apart from thoughts. So actually, mm -hmm. the tree exists inside mm -hmm. the thought tree. Nice. The experience, the awareness of tree exists because of the thought tree. The experience of the body exists because of the thought body. The experience of the house exists because of the mm -hmm. thought house. The experience of the world exists because of the thought world. Mm -hmm. So the object is inseparable from the thought, which mm -hmm. is consciousness, but in a distorted way, in an active vibration. That vibration then is translated to us in the sense of there being an actual reality out there, but that's an illusion. So you have this entire illusion inside of the box, which is the paradigm produced by believing in a point of view that's all rooted and inseparable from this ground level, fundamental, formless consciousness that we ultimately are, which at its most formless state is one with the God consciousness, it's one with the Godhead, it's one with that undiluted bliss, peace, love, purity, perfection. And at that level, it's experienced as oneness. This is why the science of enlightenment talks so much about unity or oneness, because it's a substratum of all appearances, everything is a subset as an appearance. It's a wave on the ocean of unity of the one great beingness, God. But really, we are that God, we just believe and perceive through our perspectives, and then we collapse that into 
further illusory experiences that seem more and more dense, the more we forget that we're God. Therefore, it seems like we're separate. Now we're acting on that illusion mm -hmm. of separation as if it is a reality. And it becomes this big mess of unconscious actions, reactions, thoughts, emotions, and the storehouse of karma, as you could say, or uh, tendencies or vasanas or samskaras, as they say it in India. And then the goal, in a sense, becomes to clear out these distortions or tendencies, these perspectives, these points of views, these beliefs, these thoughts, to resolve them back into that unity consciousness. That is the science of enlightenment, which is both a gradual journey as well as not, because it it's or we already are this consciousness, mm -hmm. this pure God consciousness, but we can't just say that as a thought and then continue to live as we had. So the gradual aspect is to bring this into practice. And these tendencies naturally resolve themselves as we hold onto ourselves as consciousness, because again, the ego is an effect that arises. So our sense of self is an effect that arises based on what consciousness collapses itself around, what consciousness is looking at in a simplified sense. And so if consciousness is looking at itself for long enough, the sense of self transforms we become naturally understanding of and identified with the God state ultimately. And then in that, the more we hold on to that, all these tendencies are burned up, they're resolved, they are purified very instantly, very quickly, so to speak, mm -hmm. because ultimately, we're in a timeless state. So it's really a process of shifting one's ego, one's sense of self, retracing the steps of that ego where it came from. How often do you think it's relevant to actually solve these, whatever it is, catalysts on the level where people experience them, as opposed to actually trying to zoom out and look more directly at consciousness itself? The most direct path is to hold on to consciousness itself. This is tricky because, well, it's not tricky in and of itself, but it's tricky for a lot of people because there's so much momentum and believe invested in our perceptions, that to counteract that momentum, to counteract that belief, you need really clear, direct, powerful experience of yourself as formless consciousness, typically repeatedly, almost continuously, in order to release those beliefs as real. Because the moment you forget, you again believe in what you've believed in for millions of years, so to speak, and you'll continue to re-manifest that and need symbolization to hint you back to yourself. So we're really describing a high level of soul, soul maturity of true interest in the true self. If the interest in the true self is mighty high, then the direct path is the way to go. And you don't need to deal too much with the individual perceptions and beliefs and points of view. If your interest in it is not high, you're going to fail at this, you're just not going to succeed, because it requires every day, every minute to minute effort almost of maintaining awareness. And since most of us don't do that, because we lack the interest in it, because we're too filled with desires caused by different symbolized perceptions. This is, this is a great introduction for people. And it's a good sort of tool in the toolbox to have. But on a practical note, people are going to have to look at the level that they can reliably and consistently be aware of and purify themselves more gradually. Does that answer yeah. the heart of your question? I like mm -hmm. the distinction about interest too. It really depends on the readiness. Mm -hmm. and, and when we say readiness of the student, we really mean soul readiness, like deep level readiness, which can grow fast in a single lifetime, even if someone at a soul level is not that interested in this, through their catalytic experiences and their suffering and their turbulent experiences. And their wisdom and their discrimination and good company of like wise people, one can very quickly come to the heart of the understanding that everything is transit, uh, transient. And one can suddenly gain a deep interest in the truth of that eternal changeless state of consciousness. But again, it will transform one's worldview because you become less reliant on symbolizations, which for so many people has become their sense of home, their sense of safety, security, comfort. It's all invested in the house, the body, and the tree. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we in, in Holland, we have a saying. 
huisje, boompje, beestje. What's it mean? Um, <laughs> Verbate, like directly. What it means mean? little house, little tree, and little creature or little <laughs> animal. In this case, the animal is the human being. Aww. But it's like that expressing just sort of um, actually, bon pied, this cozy feeling of, you know, the comfort that you have in your own home and with your own attachments and stuff. <laughs> so that's why I kind of drew the creature as the human, but the house, the tree, and the. <laughs> mm-hmm. Cute. It's when you say, um, you were saying about focusing on awareness and like um, being more identified with your consciousness. You're saying you need to be committed because it takes a lot of hard work. And I was thinking it's unfortunate. It's not actually that it in itself is hard work. It's just that our muscles, like exactly like when we're becoming fit, we've been training our whole life to be identified and aware of the wrong things. So we've got like the, the wrong kind of muscles essentially. We just need to completely retrain ourselves and condition ourselves towards being aware of what's really true and aware in the direction of our awareness. And just like getting fitter, it actually gets easier as your muscles develop. And you've said, I've heard you say quite a lot of times, like enlightenment is a habit. I think that is just so accurate, but also good to see that um, unenlightenment or lack of awareness is also a habit that mm-hmm. we've been mm. like an brought up doing. Yeah. The mind has to turn from laziness to intense alertness and desire for the truth of its own nature. Only then does the direct path really start to show its fruits. And it is a rough, I love the analogies used, and it is a lot, it's a rough process, just like physically going through a boot camp experience or military training or something, or like Iron Man. It's rough, like you're gonna face yourself, you're gonna have to gut yourself, you're gonna have to, you know, it's it's a guttural, visceral, transformative experience, and nothing of your old self remains, in a sense, you have to really transform everything. This is even more the case, even more sort of shockingly the case, at a psychological, spiritual level, because not only are you transforming one aspect that you've associated yourself with, in this case, the body, you're actually transforming your worldview, your mm-hmm. understanding, your mm-hmm. sense of self. It's It goes to the very root of what we feel, believe we are, and that we've become attached to and identified with. So it is only, people can dabble in it, no problem. People can be introduced to it, no problem. But one who takes it to a really high degree of consciousness of enlightenment is rare because it requires someone who has more interest in the truth of their condition free consciousness, then they have interest in how she won't be beige, mm-hmm. in the relationship, in the wives, in the children, in the career, in the success, in the friendships, in the uh, acquisition of wealth, and so forth. You know, show me a person who mm-hmm. is truly, truly more dedicated, more interested in that than any of these components mm-hmm. I just laid out. So people that are highly interested in those things have not yet realized that it's all full of pain. Mm-hmm. Um, and they kind of know, but they don't want to look at it, yeah. which is cool. And I, I, I don't always share it in this way, because even though I see it as the truth that life is suffering, which is kind of Buddha's first noble truth, is the observation life is suffering. And that there's a way out of suffering. But once you really see that life as we've defined it, it's not really life, it's the world, it's the world of perceptions and assumptions and labels, that anything temporary, pleasure is followed by pain, pain is followed by pleasure, they're, they chase each other, they're interdependent. I mean, I could go on and on and on describing this. Um, and like I said, the Yoga Vasishta does a great job in its first main chapter of this passion, just like 20 pages of this uh, profound exclamation of Mm -hmm. exposition of uh, how life is suffering. But somehow for the ripe student, that fills him or her with joy, with this great liberating bliss. Whereas for the person that's really deeply attached to feeling identified with Haushibombi Beisha, little house, little (laughs) tree, little creature. Little tree. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) It is... uh, 
it's just not appealing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's depressing. It's something to avoid. Wisdom is something to avoid. Ignorance is bliss. Because otherwise you have to face all your attachments and this mm -hmm. false sense of self that you've produced by being so focused on the little tree, the little mm -hmm. creature in the little house. So everyone can dabble in these teachings. Everyone can have the tool in their toolbox and recognize it to some degree and begin to practice. And then the wisdom will grow over time. But we don't have that much time in this lifetime. 10 yeah. years flies by, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't know you could die tomorrow. So it really is. It depends on the ripeness and the readiness of the student in terms of how direct mm -hmm. they can take this path or and that's why I've diluted a lot of these teachings um, into making sort of concessions and distillations that I feel are relevant at different levels of dedication, different levels of earnest desire or interest in this. Uh, out of compassion, honestly, seeing that, because at the highest levels, some of the perspectives that came to me, the perceptions were, this is almost unfair. No mm -hmm. one is going to want this level of gutting yourself empty and transforming yourself to this degree and ending up with a, a reality that is completely 100% devoid of everything people ever know have ever known and hold dear. It's unfair. No one's going to do this. You can't promote this. You can't advertise this. You could try, but no one's going to understand it. No one's going to take it in the proper way. It's going to get distorted anyway. So I might as well distort it myself so that I meet them at their level of distortion, their level of comfort, so that then at that level, it's made clear. It's not as diluted as it would be if they distort this message. So I distorted myself. I incorporate different teachings for different levels in order to accommodate the student at their level of willingness or desire for the truth. So it is rare, but the dark path is the most direct path mm -hmm. of holding on to that base consciousness. But it, there's, you see, there's nothing in it for the ego that has been formed, the rainbow effect, the ego effect mm -hmm that has been formulated and this ghost that now appears so real in the back of people's sense of self, which drives every one of their motivations and actions and interactions and, and, and manipulations and so forth and desires and goals. And we push and we push and we push. We don't, it, there's nothing in the truly highest teachings that sounds appealing to that mm -hmm. ego effect at that level. So we kind of have to dangle a carrot in front of the no nose of uh, front of the eyes of the ego with certain promises and certain things that aren't necessarily untrue, but they're, they apply to a more relative level. They're stepped down from their original state. And um, yeah, this, I mean, this is less and less my passion. I mean, I've created this I, type of teachings, these different levels, but it's less and less my passion or I have less and less uh, fuel for that, so to speak, because it's not relevant to the higher level students. And it's not that interesting. Once you get beyond that main threshold of readiness for detachment. Mm -hmm. So when most people talk about transcending the ego, usually they're talking about like, getting rid of sort of superficial vanity, probably mm -hmm. like doing something out of just trying to look good to their friends or whatever. But this, this, what you just described as totally gutting your entire point of view, it makes what people usually think of as transcending the ego just look like more ego play, just more activity on the same level of ego. Mm -hmm. So ego is malleable. Ego can take on different levels, different forms, different degrees of perception, different degrees of attachment, different degrees of ignorance, different degrees of making the illusion appear dense and real. So essentially, there's three, you could see enlightenment as a spectrum. But essentially, there's three main steps in the journey, m three main elevations or enlightenments. One is the awakening from oneself as the personality one begins to realize, hey, I'm much more than just my thoughts and emotions. Once they begin to see that, and they become sort of aware of this witnessing quality of consciousness that's present within them, 
and they begin to understand that in in essence they are a soul that's having a human experience rather than being a human that was born that's sort of the first most relative level of enlightenment it plants the seed for the journey then the second elevation which is most typically described as enlightenment is where the individuated consciousness begins to turn so deeply into its own source, into its own essence of pure I amness, beingness, that the vast majority, if not all, of the tendencies are relinquished. And a sense of self no longer projects itself around objects. It now is free, like space, or like the sky. And therefore, it has no world that belongs to it. And it doesn't belong to the world. It's free, it's ingraspable, it's untouchable. This is when you take the teachings of presence and awareness and aware beingness and so forth and the I amness. When you take this all the way, you end up in this sort of God state, Satchitananda, bliss, consciousness, light. This is typically what we view of as nirvana or enlightenment. This is the second type of enlightenment or elevation. This is the second main threshold or elevation. And then the third is when even the God consciousness, ego, has become so dense with its own illusion or slash reality that it collapses in on itself and it reveals the absolute infinite reality which is not only formless but also qualityless and it's ab it's indescribable absolute infinite perfection and i won't go into it uh, in this session but um that is the third elevation or the third main threshold of enlightenment and only at that level is all ego relinquished, is all illusory sense of self relinquished. But the God state comes closest. It's the God ego. It's the pure ego in its original state of love, bliss, and light. And, and oneness. It's the oneness ego. I don't know if that answered kind of mm -hmm. what you were saying. But. Mm -hmm. I just remembered earlier you said uh, that emotions didn't totally fit in the Mm -hmm. final category because there's a way that they sort of interweave through all of them. Nice. So the way that we're typically aware of emotions with the conscious mind fits in to this model at the level that I've uh, described it, along with thoughts and emotions and worldly sense perceptions. But, um, and we already shot an episode, I'm not sure when it will be published in relationship in order to this uh, podcast, but Either it's already been published for those that are listening right now, or it will be published in one of the next few weeks. But I refer to that podcast on the emotional guidance system for great in-depth knowledge on how, what is the purpose of emotions? What are they really? And how are they actually guidance, constant guidance? And how can they be utilized as such? And how does it apply to enlightenment? Because ultimately, every emotion is a distortion and therefore guiding us back into unity or perfection. So therefore, the emotional guidance system doesn't really belong in that last category. It's more, it's always there, it's always guiding us. It just as we go deeper in consciousness, as we become subtler, and we go back to the paradigm level, and the perspective or point of view level, the emotional guidance system is still present, we still feel a certain way, when we begin to vibrate along the line of a certain point of view that feeling, even though it's much more subtle than, oh, he cheated on me, and now I feel bad, and she did this to me, and he did, it's not that dramatic, it's subtle. But there's still distinction there. There's still a quality, a feeling quality, that will respond to us taking on that point of view. And that is still guidance. And now it might be compared to our daily emotions, it may appear to be a super joyful feeling. But that joyful feeling at that higher level, is still guidance and is actually becomes in a sense a negative feeling mm. and therefore a pointer it becomes like a I don't, nah, feels illusory it's like ah oh, and it guides us even deeper back to the original unity oh, that's cool so the emotional guidance system doesn't just apply to the physical ego like trying to find its way through life and align itself to its goals better and believe in more positive thoughts and emotions it actually moves us all the way back into the one infinite creator if we learn how to pay attention to it so the emotional guidance system really could be visualized as a line that goes straight up through the center of all these four levels. Mm -hmm. I think that pretty much covers that. Let's see if we have any more notes on this. I'd like to hear your thoughts on something as well before we go into something different. 
Um, when you're talking about the elevations of enlightenment or awakening, I do feel that a lot of people get stuck at that threshold of realizing that they're not the body, they're not the personality, they're not the soul, but they don't navigate to having a direct experience of themselves. Because from my perspective, I feel that the ego is kind of smart. It like, well, it's not kind of smart, it's extremely smart. Well, the ego effect, it's shape-shifting. Once you have sort of a spiritual interest, then it kind of morphs into a spiritual interest. And then you get, you confuse what you're actually doing. You start to um, get really into spiritual things like yoga or um, what you believe is meditation. I know I was meditating for years before I actually meditated and recognized my true self, um, which is kind of a ruse because I did feel that um, I was working on it. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that I was meditating on the objects, like watching my thoughts, um, or meditating on the breath, or visualization, and like what you're still doing, although it's technically called meditation, you're still focusing on what you're not. Mm -hmm. And you're still even inside of the stage, mm -hmm. right? For the most part, you're still inside the paradigm of I'm this body and this life and da da da, and all these beliefs that are crystallized. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's like, I do feel that that I was there for so long at that threshold of like knowing that I was not this body and knowing I was something else, but I wasn't actually able to, I didn't have a direct experience for quite some time into what I actually was because that territory is kind of like really tricky because it's appearing like what you're looking for, mm -hmm. but it's not it at all. So do you have from, maybe from both of your guys' sides, what do you feel are the main things that stop people from getting to that direct experience or um, yeah, what could help people in this situation? Actually, the first thing that comes to mind is um, something you mentioned earlier, the good company. It's like, it's like you have to have something come in and just plant that seed. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I was seeking all over the place, like going to all kinds of different courses and reading different books and, and just like tracking something that felt inward. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was just more horizontal searching. It just led to more other interesting stuff to look at, more other fun things to learn and practice and try. And so it wasn't until, it, I think it was Bentinho was the first person that I really heard point directly there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Finally, like, like, and actually it wasn't even until a couple of years after I'd been following you that I really grokked it, that it was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's like, why didn't you tell me that earlier? Why did you waste my time with all this horizontal, like mm -hmm. empowerment stuff, how to improve my life, how to uh, understand the emotional guidance system. All of this felt like suddenly such a byproduct, mm -hmm. like such a, such a, side thing but I'm so grateful in retrospect because it's what hooked me mm -hmm. and then yeah awesome yeah love that <laughs> that's great yeah well that exemplifies the reason for stepping down the direct teachings totally. in ways mm -hmm. that people can actually relate to it within their paradigm otherwise you've lost them from the get-go totally mm -hmm. and the empowerment or the less direct teachings are great because they teach you how to essentially achieve all of your wildest dreams. But then you'll find that you have a moment of achieving all these things and you're kind of like, That's so true. now what? Like you have this sense of being like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> right. Hmm. And you're kind of like back to the drawing board. Okay, like, oh, I got shit. it. Okay, I'm here now. Yeah. So it is um, in some ways good to go all the way in. And for some people that will be enough and it will be perfect. Um, but for other people, um, your life will always reroute you to the true path that you're meant to be on. But the direct path is like when I really, really, really got it, I was so, I just couldn't believe that I didn't get it the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it was like life just went from being um, like the saturation went up, like the vibrancy went up. It went from being kind of, like I thought I had a pretty colorful life, but it really took on an actual color and a vibrancy like never had before. 
And it was so obvious. Like, I just couldn't believe it. But it had to happen that way. It was really cool. Mm. Lovely. Mm. Yeah, become more alive. That's literally what you, the more alive you become, the less you need crutches. Mm -hmm. The house, the tree and the creature are crutches. And this scares people because they're attached to the crutches. It's like, well, I don't, I don't know how to walk without the crutches. Well, mm. you try, you know, you might find you can run much faster without them. You can have much more fun without them. You can feel much more alive without them. But for most people, that's a gradual process. I just have people in mind that that want they want this freedom. They want everybody it. does. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like there are just such they're just so good Stubborn. at yeah. Mm -hmm. Truly, though, it's like, so I've had to learn so much about respecting free will and respecting what they're truly asking for. Um, but it's just the weirdest. It's, it's like these really clever ways of just like mm -hmm. skirting the topic that they know they want. Yeah. Yep. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the dawning of true wisdom is really when people go through these experiences of attaining things that they thought they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of cool for a minute or 10. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, and then the rat race starts again, mm -hmm. and again, and again. And, and some people learn to deal with that. And there's this whole, and I tried it for a while just to see if it works. <laughs> but it's just not sustainable. For some people, it's sustainable, but only for a lifetime or maybe oh, 10 lifetimes. Yeah. But like this whole motivational world, this whole trend of empowerment, in a more physicalized way, like grinding, like success, like, you know, I won't name any names, but you know, a lot of the speakers and that sort of are thought leaders mm -hmm. in this trend, the social trend. And it's, it's great, it's much better. It's closer to self knowledge, than being super lazy and complacent and victimy, for sure. Mm -hmm. But still, there is an exhaustion underneath that is that they're typically afraid to recognize. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them, even I loved one of these speakers said something like, uh, and I love the guy, I think he's great. Said something like, I'm afraid of meditation. Yeah, I don't want to meditate, because I don't want to fuck up this brain. I love my brain so much. It's, he said something along those yeah, lines. Yeah. Like, it's so perfect. It's so dialed in. I don't want to meditate and find out something that would deconstruct. <laughs> I don't want to disrupt it. Yeah, yeah, it's like working so well for you. Right? <laughs> wow. So in the rare case, you can develop a mindset and, and a brain and, and an empowerment capacity that works so well. And you're, and you're so able to see every challenge in a positive way. And you're so able to transmute negativity into positivity and productivity and so forth. That And that is, I mean, that's preferable for sure. And it gains you awareness of yourself for sure. But it is definitely not what people are looking for ultimately. And the gaining of wisdom, true wisdom, not relative wisdom, not insight, not knowledge, not uh, empowerment based wisdom, but true wisdom, the depth of the soul maturing is when it becomes more devotional, when it becomes more surrendered, when it wants to know its true self beyond the transient phenomena of time and effort and cause and effect when it becomes tired of that, when it starts to see through this endless mist and starts to see that life in that sense is suffering, that's when great wisdom dawns. It can come with a period of despondency or disappointment or depression. That's why someone has to sort of be ready for it and have the spiritual faith to sort of carry them through that dark night of the soul. I mean, ultimately, everyone will get through it just fine. But it can be harder or easier depending on a person's level of faith and preparation by being exposed to those kinds of teachings like this. But then the true wisdom will take one from that shore of transient focus to the shore of the eternal focus and the truly blissful, the truly liberating focus. And then the practice begins of stepping in the boat and crossing that river to the other shore. But then one has a sense of that and a desire for that. If you don't have a desire for that, you just, mm -hmm. you may 
move away from your initial shore for like a few feet, but then you're like, no, let's get back. Yeah, I don't, what am I doing? This is wobbly <laughs> as fuck. You know, the boat is wobbly. I'd rather be on solid land that I'm used to. But the wobbliness become, you know, the uncertainty, the confusion, the lack of sense of solid self, that all becomes navigatable, so to speak, becomes manageable mm -hmm. when we have true faith and true desire mm -hmm. and ideally a good teacher or good company uh, is, is massively helpful to help us, guide us through this sort of mm -hmm. weird state where we could come to all kinds of weird conclusions and stagnate and fall into some kind of a temporary psychological spiritual trap or with a misplaced sense of self. And like, we'll get out of it eventually. There's no, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every droplet ultimately returns back to the ocean, even if it's a long journey through becoming dirt water and like river water and waterfall. And But everyone ultimately returns to the ocean. But good guidance and good company is crucial in navigating this within a single lifetime with great success. Mm. But what's required is earnest interest and the dawning of true wisdom to see the transitory nature of phenomena and chasing phenomena. And then one becomes ripe and ready for the true bliss of the true self and greater unity of awareness with God. And then you find what you know then, only then, you've always been looking for. And you know then, everyone is searching for it. Everyone is calling for it. That's why this calling is overwhelming for those of us who are already there and sensitive to it. Because you see everything you see, every person you meet on the street or not meet, everything you see on TV, on social media, you just see all these helpless people that are not really helpless, but they believe they're helpless, just crying for this realization. But they don't want it even when it's presented. Mm -hmm. They will even crucify it, right? Mm -hmm. Many times in history, they've crucified it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, because of the attachments to Hashi mm -hmm. and the lack of true wisdom and true readiness. It's just the way it is. And um, yeah, hopefully if some people hear this, they'll have a big shift or it'll give them some uh, confidence that they're not alone and that the choppy waters is part of the process. Yeah, the value of a good teacher and good company can't be overstated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is again, the fools will negate wisdom and fight it with every hair on their body, right? So if you say even something as simple as that, we need a good teacher or we need good company, mm -hmm. you know, the ego, <laughs> the ego based around the house, the tree and the creature mm -hmm. will fight to defend that entitlement and that false sense of self, even though it's causing itself pain. Be your own teacher. Yeah, be your own yeah. teacher. You got to be independent. Nobody <laughs> knows better than you. Well, actually, yes, there's lots of people that know way better than you. <laughs> way better than you do. There's people that know you way better than you ever known yourself. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And that's just the case. And this universe, this creation is filled with teachers. Mm -hmm. And we should make use of that. And we should begin to respect, again, true spiritual teachers. Now, of course, there has been a lot of um, distortion also in, in egoic mm -hmm. uh, tendencies and teachers and so forth. So I, I get the skepticism. Um, but ultimately, yeah, we, we do have to find some form of teacher that can that can be inner, but often it's somewhat diluted. Um, it can be books, it can be videos, it can be a physical, actual human body that has established itself in this state to a high degree and is able to clarify this to a great degree and gives one a sense of confidence and the toolbox they need. It can be a community, although it's typically not that fast because the community a community of quasi deluded people is still just gonna mm -hmm. kind of rummage around in the mud and try to uh, attempt a conscious community, but it's gonna fail most in most cases, or at least it's not really gonna take them that deep, because it's just gonna be a reflection, another reflection of where everyone's at. So great leadership and great teachers and great teachings are needed and respect for them is needed for one's own sake. The teacher, the true teacher doesn't care if you respect him. It's for your own sake. You're inviting great disease and um, suffering into your life. If you sort of say you're open to it, but you're disrespecting the teaching and the teacher, it's just for you, you're not going to benefit from that. Assuming it's a true teaching or it's a true teacher. Um, but 
yes, can highly accelerate and highly guide and support the process for an entity to cross that river, or even make its attempt to cross a river, which is already remarkable, and will already be so much better than just than just believing in thoughts and emotions and sense perceptions. Even though it's challenging, it will be more fulfilling, one will be more alive. And whatever one has gained in terms of learning and growth in consciousness will be taken with that entity upon the cessation of the body. How Shibon Pubesha will be gone forever mm -hmm. from your consciousness. So what will you take with you? It's what you've learned, how you've grown. How subtle have you become able to know yourself? How directly have you become able to know yourself, see yourself, marinate in yourself, be conscious, maintain awareness of yourself? That intensity is what you take with you, that intensity of the density of consciousness. And therefore, again, the density of the illusion appearing real becomes less and less needed. But yeah, this is a very, even though people are spiritually waking up, it's a very unfriendly world at this point, unfriendly society, when it comes to the true teachings, the true interaction of teacher and student. Yeah. It has become greatly distorted, partly because of teachers, but also um, that has been further exacerbated by uh, people's biases and people's mm -hmm. egos fighting against this principle of, of surrender or devotion or trust mm -hmm. or faith. Um, yes, ultimately, you have to have faith in yourself, but there's nothing more beautiful and accelerating and helpful to be open, at least open to having someone know better than you do about yourself. But how to gauge, I mean, it is a little tricky how to gauge who to trust, right, in that process. So I don't blame people for being skeptical. But, um, but it is, at the same time, it's not an ideal scenario anymore, as compared to, mm. hypothetically speaking, two, three thousand years ago, when you're in the forests in India, and, and people love holy men, and, and they kind of recognize wisdom when they see it. And there's sort of a natural relationship that follows and there's a natural dedication to those teachings that begin to, to take a hold in people's hearts. And then there's a great acceleration of this message being embodied. But we don't really have that because we're so isolated, independent, family, house, uh, tree, creature oriented, mm -hmm. that it's just not part of our consciousness, really, to, to have that type of a loving relationship to our own inner teachers and to also outer teachers. And again, I don't blame people. I don't recommend people go out there and just blindly start following or trusting or like giving their power away to another entity that mm -hmm. claims to be teacher. But use your guidance system, use your intellect, but also use your intuition. And if you find someone that you trust, and their knowledge, their wisdom works for you, and it begins to enliven your vibration, your aliveness, your consciousness, the density of your self awareness increases rapidly, and your sense of potential increases, then develop a trusting, loving, respectful relationship to that being or teaching that will help you greatly. One thing uh, just stood out a little bit is the, the potential that somebody else knows me better than I know myself. Like, how could how could that be? <laughs> because you don't know yourself. Most people don't know themselves. So of course, it's easy to know people better than they know themselves because they don't know themselves. If you know yourself, you know other selves. It's not, we're not different. Mm -hmm. Are there certain nuances that you may not have experienced in recent memory? Yes. <laughs> uh, would that require a little bit more sort of empathetic effort to then be able to relate to in a way that they're stuck in that paradigm? Yeah, sure. There is a there's something to say for practicing empathy and such. But at a fundamental level, a true teacher, which simply means someone who's gone through this journey already, to a higher degree anyways than you have, they see what you're going through, they recognize that and their only intention, if they are pure, is to help you. And if they've gone deep enough, then they are naturally pure, because God purifies the soul. So God awareness purifies the soul. And therefore, the only desire left is to be of service. And the only desire left for this incarnation is to be of service. So what 
whatever you know in yourself, you can know in another, right? It's not that it's not rocket science, like mm. parents recognize what their kids are going through in puberty, because they've been there done that it's that simple. They know the kids better sometimes in some aspects, than they know themselves. Now, if the parent is totally biased and has belief systems, then yes, they won't know the child better than they know themselves. So it's a flawed analogy. But a true teacher has resolved their biases to a great or even complete extent to where they're not coming at it from a biased point of view. Their receptive and their sensitivity is so amplified beyond the physical senses and beyond the intellect that most people view themselves through and beyond the ego sense that they can see straight through you. And they can therefore know yourself way better than you know yourself. And that's something to be utilized with caution with care, with using every, you know, hair on your body as a bullshit meter. But it ideally, it should be utilized if you wish to accelerate your journey. And the best alternative to that would be just to study the books of the teachers that have been well respected over time, the scriptures and so forth, mm -hmm. they can help, they can be your guru also. But this this arrogance of thinking we know ourselves because we've lived for 40 years, and we've gone through some physical challenges, and we've gone through some heartbreaks. It's folly. <laughs> it's folly. If the majority of your consciousness <laughs> has been on sense perceptions and intellect, you have no fucking clue who you are. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's possible. You don't know how to navigate the waters of deeper levels of consciousness. And you need a teaching or a teacher, if you wish to attain that. If not, then you'll stay in your bubble, your paradigm and your thoughts. Um, but that's not wisdom. That's just being more knowledgeable, being a little smarter, but it's not true wisdom. A true teacher sees straight through the person. That's why it's hard to have personal relationship with a student, like of a personal friendship nature. It's, I, I mean, I'm quite lucky now to have quite a few people around me that are very clear uh, through the practice of the teachings and through associating mm. with me, they have become very clear. So, but but it's uh, it's only been recently that I've kind of felt like, oh, I can actually sort of personally just be playful, let my hair down and interact with people um, around me in a comfortable way. Because you see through everything or whatever is relevant to see through, you see through. And most people are threatened by that, right? And so it naturally becomes a very uncomfortable situation mostly for them. But being or being in that energy is not very interesting <laughs> yeah. to the teacher either. Right. Like, there's mm -hmm. better ways to spend one's time. Um, but yeah, the bottom line, there's definitely beings that know you better than you know yourself. Do they know all the details of your memory? No, maybe not. But <laughs> mm -hmm. they are a fundamental structural hierarchical level when it comes to consciousness, what you really are, and how you can navigate from where you're at to where you truly want to be and recognize your true desire and reflect that back to you and show you your false desires, the desires that you are believing in, but they're actually leading you down a path that you don't want, and so on and so forth. Those fundamental things. There are teachers that know you better in that way than you know yourself. And if you resist that, it's just folly, it's just ego, it's just perpetuating your stubbornness and your sense of self and your suffering. So then have at it. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that remains to be says, like you have whatever you want, insist upon that, out of fear, all you want, don't trust your instincts, don't trust your ability to gauge, just come at it from a biased, socially <laughs> reinforced point of view, and miss out on this golden nugget of, uh, of finding a true teacher mm -hmm. in your life and and teaching or teaching it doesn't always have to come with a physical teacher it can be a teaching. The mm -hmm. teaching is the teacher mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. form of language. It's so lucky to have it in the form of a physical teacher, though. I mean, I feel like hanging out with you has been like perpetually getting my bubble popped. So whatever bubble I'm in, there's like, if I come into contact with you, it's just like, bink, over and over to the extent where over time, it's just like, the less I can put up a bubble, the better. So I'm, I feel like the training has been to just not enter bubbles mm -hmm. more and more and more and more. Nice. Yeah. So having your paradigms popped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And this has led to great accelerated growth, no? Totally. Like, picture yourself, um, 
because I kind of have a, a vision of the parallel version of you that never attended that first session in Boulder. Whoa. Right? Based on your tendencies up to that Whoa. point and your bubbles up to that point. Mm -hmm. And just, and th this is just a general practice. Everyone can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, for, especially those who have found teachings like this, uh, like a, a few years ago, and they have done this work. And sure, it's, all, it's been uncomfortable from time to time, right? It's not always been a pleasant really, journey. Yeah. But take the aliveness that you have now, the self-awareness, the awareness of life, the path, mm -hmm. yourself, what you really want, what you're made of, what's possible, and compare that to yourself had you not found these teachings and just living still automatic pilot monkey mind sheep life um and you'll appreciate the existence of the universe of god expressing itself through all kinds of teachers and teachings and for you you thank yourself for your willingness and openness to face yourself and to receive that type of connection or teaching yeah mm -hmm. absolutely that's a crazy comparison, actually. Mm -hmm. It's very different. Yeah. And same for me. If I think back, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, even, had I gone a different type of course or like very different, I'm not that, I'm not that being. Like it's mm -hmm. a different being. I, I told my mom the other day, I'm not your son. Like I've told her many times, but <laughs> 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 um, it's hard for a mother, you know, to understand. Yeah. But it's like when someone else, this is just an example, mm -hmm. and we all have people in our lives that relate to our past selves and see us now mm -hmm. as the same entity that we were then. And we have no relationship to that entity left. If you've gone deep into the work, you really have become a parallel reality mm -hmm. version of your soul. There's nothing left in that personality that has anything to do with you. Your memory might even fade. It's like feels like the most distant thought of a dream you had 20 years ago. It's like, well, mm -hmm. how are you relating to me <laughs> as if I'm in that picture? That's not me in that picture. Even if I look at my earliest videos mm -hmm. on YouTube or something, which I don't do very often. <laughs> it's not that interesting. Or pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I've been told it helps a lot of people, so I leave it up there. But, uh, but it's, like, it's like I'm listening to another guy. Mm -hmm. It really is that way. That's not me. Um, so it's like, oh, cool. Let's let's hear what he has to say. And I don't remember anything that I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that session was like, whoa, it's just a memory of a dream I had 20 years ago. So <laughs> we're all parallel versions of ourselves every single nanosecond. But over what we call time, many shifting through many parallel, slightly different parallel realities over time, which is an illusion we then really are a different point of view of consciousness. And therefore, we are an entirely different paradigm. Therefore, we are an entirely different personality. It's actually mathematically, quantum mechanically, even physically, it's a different being. Mm -hmm. It's a different individual. You're not your past, literally not your past. It's literally someone else's past. It doesn't mean you can't you know, if there's remnants of that past, like emotional remnants or traumatic remnants, then they are still part of your makeup today, and you got to do the work with them. But as an entity, as an individual, it's someone else, and it's someone else's past. Different timeline. And the benefit of teachers and teachings, and the receptivity you can have to that, the embrace, the warm, loving embrace you can have of that, the respect you can have for that, greatly accelerates one's ability, typically, to shift into a more desirable, purer, more self-realized version of oneself. And the difference is vast. Over mm -hmm. time, the difference is vast. You'll not recognize yourself. It literally is like seeing someone else. Would you concur? Mm -hmm. I remember hearing you say a few years ago, if you just commit six months to these teachings and really commit to yourself and your growth, like you will have radically transformed. And it took me a while before I was really ready to be like, okay, now I'm officially committing these six months because <laughs> I was scared shitless. Um, <laughs> but once I did, I was like, whoa, he was so right. Like he was so right. Um, but there are so many reasons you talk yourself out of it. Um, 
and I've said before, like if only you could have like a small taster of like what lies on the other side. Mm. Um, mm. But then on the other side of that, then you would lose the the richness of learning um, faith and yeah. trust along the journey. Mm-hmm. Totally. So I actually wouldn't give myself um, that taster if I could go back. Mm. Um, but it would have been maybe good to have known. Well, mm-hmm. well, that's the people it. who won't cross that river. Mm-hmm. Without the glimpse, we'll get the glimpse. And that's mm. why. So this Whoa. is one of the most common things I hear from students is, ah, oh, you know, 15 years ago, for three days, I was in this state you described. And then <laughs> it disappeared. And now I have to work for it. And I can't find it back. What happened? Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. All kinds of variations of this. Yeah, And it's because your higher self, a higher level intelligence, which is an actual version of you, that is its own entity relating mm-hmm. to you, through the boundaries of space and time, which are not real from higher levels of consciousness. So we can do that. There's cross time, space, dimensions, communication between yourself and other versions, levels of yourself. That higher le- level of consciousness, more realized version of you, will literally give you a glimpse, put you in a state for half a day or even a minute mm-hmm. or like maybe a couple weeks or sometimes even longer. And then your tendencies will be yours again. The choice is yours again. And now it is up to you, your free will, to be baffled by this glimpse, mm-hmm. to inspire a sense of seeking, which is typically a pre-incarnational agreement or program with yourself, that if you don't follow this particular sort of line of thought, you'll have a safety switch and you'll have a glimpse that will redirect the course. It's still up to your free will, but you're kind of given a little nugget of like a little reminder, a little shock of the bliss that is possible, of the freedom of the true self so that you'll start mm-hmm. seeking it with your physical conscious ego mind. Yeah, cool. I think even in meditation, or I mean, even even along the path that's happening, often though, it's like you'll get these glimpses of just like the deepest meditation you've ever been in. It's like, oh, damn. And then it's mm-hmm. harder to get back later. Like something made it so easy to get in that time. Mm. Mm-hmm. And then later, it's like, that is just the anchor point. Like that is just the carrot. Like, oh, I know that's in there though. I'll never forget that's in there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys. Thank Loved you. Uh, hearing your stories and nuances. That was awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. Thank you. More of that, please. Love it. I think viewers will appreciate it too. Listeners. <laughs> 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 winky, winky. <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. Hope you have an awesome day and um, lots of love.